and sit comfortably and close the eyes. And put our attention on the silence that is always there deep in the mind. This is the silent witness. Connect with that silent witness, become the silent witness. Watch the conscious thinking mind. And listen to the yoga of Ashishta from the perspective of the silent witness. Book three, chapter 119. Verse 32. The mind has obtained its calm composure views creation as full of the presence of God. Those who are led by their own convictions take the non-existent for reality. Like children believing Ghosts are real existences. The consciousness of individual ego causes the error of the objective knowledge of creation. The tranquil unconsciousness of ourselves brings us to the knowledge of the Supreme, who is above the objective and inert creation. These different created things appear in a different light to the wise who view them all in the unity of God. Just as the intelligent well know that toy puppets of play soldiers are composed of mud and clay. The plenitude of the world is without beginning or end and appears as faultless. or perfect piece of workmanship. It is full with the fullness of the Supreme Being. And remains full in the fullness of God. This fullness, which appears as the created world, is essentially the great Brahma and is situated in his greatness. Just as the sky is situated in the sky, tranquility in tranquility and joy in joy. Look at the reflection of a very long landscape in a mirror. Or the picture of a far stretching city.
in a miniature. And you will find distances lost in the closeness. So the distances of worlds are lost in their proximity to one another in the spirit of God. Some think of the world as a non-entity. And others as an entity. By taking the world in different lights of being. A thing beside God or a reflection of Brahman. After all, it can have no reality, being like the picture of a city and not the city itself. It is as false as the appearance of clear water in a desert mirage and that of a double moon in the sky. Magicians show magic cities in the air by sprinkling handfuls of dust before our eyes. In the same way, our false consciousness represents the unreal world as a reality. unless our inborn ignorance, like an arbor of harmful plants, is burnt down to the very root by the flame of right reasoning, it will not cease to spread out its branches and grow the rankest weeds of our imaginary pleasures and sorrows. Well, this is a very clear statement of the nature of our individual karmic traces. They constitute our inborn ignorance. And our sadhana is to burn down to the very root. By the flame of right reasoning. Which means we're using our ability of discrimination or to think a thought. Thinking a thought is the fundamental discrimination ability. By using that ability to think a thought, we think the right thought, the thought that will produce the flame that burning down this collection of individual karmic traces. Chapter 120. King Lavana visits the forest where he lived as a tribal. Lamentation of the woman tribal. The Shishta continued. Now, Ram, listen to the wonderful power of error displayed in changing phenomena, like the changing forms of ornaments in the substance of the same gold. 
King Lavana, having perceived the falsehood of his vision at the end of his dream, resolved the following day to visit that great forest himself. He thought to himself, Ah, uh, when shall I revisit the Vindhyan region? It is inscribed in my mind, and I remember having undergone a great many hardships in my life there as a forester. So saying, he traveled south, accompanied by his ministers and attendants, as if he was going to make a conquest of that quarter. In a few days, he arrived at the foot of the mountain. There he wandered about the southern, eastern, and western shores of the sea. He was as delighted with his round course as the luminary of the day in his daily journey from east to west. In certain region, he saw a deep and sorrowful forest stretching wide along his path, like the dark and dismal realms of death. Wandering in this region, he saw everything he had seen in his dream. He inquired into former circumstances and wondered to learn whether they were the same as when he saw in his vision. He recognized the tribal Chandala hunters of his dream. And being curious to know the rest of the events, he continued in his wandering about the forest. And then he saw a hamlet at the edge of the wilderness, foggy with smoke, and appearing like the place where he bore the name of Pushta, Pukusha, or cherished tribal. There he saw the same huts and hovels and the various kinds of human houses, fields and plains, with the same men and women that dwelt there before. He saw the same landscapes and leafless branches of trees, shorn of their foliage by the all-devouring famine. He saw the same hunters pursuing their chase and the same helpless orphans lying about. He saw the old lady, his mother-in-law, wailing at the misfortunes of other women who were lamenting like her, with their eyes drowned in tears at the untimely deaths and innumerable miseries of their fellow brethren. The old matrons with their eyes flowing with brilliant drops of tears. Their bodies and bosoms emaciated under the pressure of their afflictions. Were mourning with loud cries of sorrow. In that dreary district. Stricken by drought and dearth. They cried, 
O oh, you sons and daughters who lie dead with your emaciated bodies for want of food for these three days. Say where you have lived, your lives fled, stricken as they were, by the steel of famine from the armor of your bodies. We remember your sweet smiles, showing your coral teeth, resembling red gunjapalas to our lords as they descended from towering palm trees with red ripe fruit held in their teeth and growing on the clad cow cloud capped mountains. When shall we again see the fierce leap of our children? springing on wolves, crouching in groves of Kadamba, Dam, Lavanga, and Gunja trees. Even in the face of Kama, the God of love, we do not see those graces that we used to see in the blue and black faces the dark color of spice leaves of our children when they feasted on their dainty food of fish and flesh. My blackish daughter, says one, the mother-in-law, has been snatched away from me with my dear husband like the dark Yamanu by the fierce Yama. Oh, they have been carried away from me like a tremendous gale blows a Tamara tree with its clustering flowers from its woodland scene. Oh, my daughter with your necklaces of the strings of red gunja seeds, gracing the firm breast of your youthful person. And with your swarthy complexion, like the sea of ink, gently shaken by the breeze. Ah, where have you fled with your clothing of wolves woven withered leaves and your teeth as black as the jet jumbo fruits. O oh, young prince, who was as fair as the full moon and did forsake the fairies of your harem, and who took so much delight in my daughter, where have you fled from us? Ah, my daughter, she too is dead in your absence and fled from my presence. Being cast on the waves of this earthly ocean, and joined to the daughter of a tribal. You were, O oh Prince, subjected to mean and vile employment in that disgraced your princely character. Ah, that daughter of mine, with her trembling eyes, like those of a timid fawn, And oh, that husband, valiant as the royal tiger, 
you are both gone together. Just as the high hopes and great efforts of men flee with the loss of their wealth. Now without a husband and lately having also lost my daughter and being thrown in a distant and barren land, I have become the most miserable and wretched of beings. Being born of a low caste, I am cast out of all prospects in life. I have become a personification of terror to myself and a sight of horror to the others. Oh, that the Lord has made me a widowed woman and subjected me to the insult of the vulgar and snobbery of the affluent, frustrated by hunger and mourning at the loss of husband and child. I rove constantly from door to door, begging for alms for my support. It is better that one who is unfortunate and friendless or subject to passions and diseases should die sooner than live in misery. Dead and inanimate beings are far better than the living miserable. Those who are without friends and who have to toil and moil in unfriendly places like the grass of earth, trampled under feet, and overwhelmed under a flood of disasters. The king, seeing his aged mother-in-law mourning in this manner, offered her some consolation through the medium of, his, of her female companion. Then he asked the lady to tell him who are you? What do you do here? Who was your daughter and who is your son? She answered him with tears in her eyes. This village is called Pukasha Gosha. Here I had a Pukasha for my husband, who had a daughter as gentle as the moon. By this accident, they were matched together. Like an ass finding by chance a pot of honey lying on her way in the forest. She lived long with him in married bliss and produced to him both sons and daughters who grew up in this forest like a gourd plant grows on a tree, serving as its support. Now we continue from the perspective of the silent witness. Start the mantra. and let it go. Follow the mantra to the deepest level of consciousness. In the Manamaya Kosha,
for individual karmic traces that have been activated and enlivened by today's reading of the Yoga Vashishta are now balancing.
Jager Dev.